Hi everyone, um, my name is Vicky and I am a software engineer at Interstellar and today I'm going to be talking about something that I think is off the chain, which is scaling blockchains in Go. And hopefully that joke only gets funnier as we go along. <laughs> so uh, to give a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today, first I'm going to address probably a question that many of you have, which is why would we even talk about blockchain scaling? This is a Go conference. And then I'll talk about some of the solutions in the space, um, go over two projects that we've worked on at Interstellar. Um, payment channels in Starlight and doing two-way pegged sidechains through SlideChain. And then finally, we'll have a little sneak preview of sort of where we go from here. So the first and the very important question is, why should I care? And one simple answer is that all of you are Go developers. A lot of us work in systems and in distributed systems. And for me, at least, I think that blockchains are an example of a really fun and cool distributed system. But you know, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about the fact that there's a lot of hype around Bitcoin, a lot of hype around blockchains. It's been 10 years. And a lot of people talk about the fact that we haven't really seen anything come of this supposedly revolutionary and amazing technology. And sort of setting aside a lot of the complicated regulatory and economic questions, there's one key fact that underlies a lot of that, which is that blockchains don't scale. <laughs> and um, there are a couple reasons for this. And so to dive into that, it's really helpful to look at sort of what a blockchain is. And so a blockchain is consisted of blocks. And as you might think, a blockchain is actually a chain of blocks. And inside of these blocks are transactions. And different platforms will represent these differently. But fundamentally, you have some sort of list of different entities sending value in between each other. And we chain them together by including what's called a hash pointer. So I hash the previous block in my current block. And that way, I've immutably committed to the entire history of all of the transactions that have happened. And so this is really nice if you think about any sort of applications for you know, t keeping track of balances or accounts or anything where you're moving value around. And it, from looking at this, it doesn't really seem like there's a big scaling problem. But one of the really useful features of a blockchain is that we operate usually on networks. And so this is where you, when you hear about words like decentralization and public networks, this means that on this network, all of those nodes, those little colorful circles, Every single one has to receive blocks and validate them. So each node is running software that is listening for blocks, um, that's validating them. And only when the entire network reaches consensus is a block considered included in the blockchain. And so what this means is that every node on a blockchain network has to see and validate every single transaction. And that doesn't scale. If we're thinking about the sort of real world applications that we need, we can't really have global public networks with every single node validating all of the transactions that consumers, businesses, people are doing. And so to talk a little more concretely about what this looks like, on the Bitcoin blockchain, it takes 10 minutes to confirm a block. So that means I submit my transaction, and I have to wait at least 10 minutes to find out whether or not it's been included in the blockchain. And some other networks do this a little bit better. In Ethereum, it's 10 to 20 seconds. On the Stellar network, which is what Interstellar runs on, it's about five seconds. But still, in terms of building applications, these are way too long of times and things that most developers and applications don't really want to work with. There are also some other challenges. So a lot of these public networks, we need all of the nodes to be able to reach consensus. They all need to be running software that can um, interact. And so it makes it really hard to change the validation rules, to change how you represent data. These things um, are really, really slow, really painful. There are long forum threads of people arguing constantly. And it's really hard to get things done. Also, if we want networks to be decentralized, it needs to be low cost to run a node. Sort of the spirit of decentralized networks is that it's not just you know, some big company running on huge servers maintaining this service. It's people running you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum or Stellar nodes on their laptops, on all different kinds of hardware. And so we need it to be really accessible. But fundamentally, the blockchain scaling problem is that every node needs to validate every transaction. And so that might seem a little bit bleak. You might be like, ah, oh, blockchains are over. OK, we can all go home now. Um, but you know, the question is, what do we do about this? And there are sort of two philosophies of blockchain scaling. Layer one is about making changes to the on-chain representation itself. Um, so building more functionality into blockchains that can get those confirmation times down from 10 minutes to a number of seconds. And then there's this layer two philosophy, which is sort of treats blockchains as a base for you to develop other applications and other ways of representing transactions. And so that's developing protocols that live on top of the blockchain. 
So you can think about layer one as being something like packaging more transactions in each block, um, changing the way that we represent data, and layer two being things like building networks of private off-chain transactions or any other things that are sort of in the on top of the blockchain space. And then another question might be, why should we use Go? Um, and for us, there are a couple of reasons that at Interstellar, we love using Go for blockchain development. Um, and one of the most important is that there's simple, lightweight native concurrency. This is super huge for, I mean, I'm sure most of the applications that we're building, but especially when we're talking about services that need to be watching for transactions on the network, submitting transactions, responding to messages. We want to be able to spawn a lot of different Go routines to take care of work and be able to clean them up really nicely, communicate between them, and there's nothing that's better for that than Go. Also, we have really easy cross-platform compilation, so when we want to build you know, lightweight um, nodes or like software that can run on a variety of hardware devices, Go makes that super simple. We just build our Go project across whatever platform we want to. Oh, yeah, sorry, let me move my hair. Um, we can just build our project and um, have it work on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. There's really good networking support, which makes our job really easy um, in terms of building uh, you know, software that has to interact with network messages. And there's also really low programming overhead. Some of our projects right now are written in Rust, and it's definitely been a challenge for our team to appoint to Rust. And so something that's really nice about Go is that it's easy for our team and also really good in terms of thinking about um, open source work and having it be easy for people to make contributions. And so I'm going to talk about one of our projects, which is called Starlight. And this is an implementation of payment channels on the Stellar network. And so a payment channel is a way of moving on-chain transactions into a private payment channel. So you can imagine that if I want to send money to my friend Alice, one way that I might do it is I can build a transaction, submit it to the network, wait for the entire globe to confirm it, and then I've sent the money to her. But alternatively, I could just tell Alice that I want to send her money. We can sort of transact privately between us with some messages. And then when we're done with whatever exchange we're having, we can settle that onto the network. Or if we have any dispute, we can also settle that publicly. And so that's sort of the philosophy behind payment channels. So an example, um, I could be starting a company called CryptoFlix, which is Netflix, but with cryptocurrency. And the way that I make my millions and millions of dollars is that I charge people one cent per minute of content that they watch on CryptoFlix. So I got my first customer, Alice. I'm very excited. And the way that I told her to give me my uh, money is that every minute she's going to build a transaction to send one cent to me, CryptoFlix, and submit that to the network. Of course, on this network, it takes five minutes to confirm. So Alice has four minutes in which to watch content and not pay me, which I am very unhappy about. So I decide to implement this with payment channels. So the most basic way of doing this is that every minute, Alice sends me a message that she owes me one more cent. And then at the end of watching Avengers Endgame, Alice owes me $1.82. She sends me that composite transaction. Everything is good. Um, and she submits that to the network, and I've gotten my money. But unfortunately, there's nothing about these messages that binds her to sending me the right amount, so she could easily just send me one cent or nothing at the end and steal all of this content from me. So actually, when we talk about these messages on payment channels, what's actually happening is that we're sending transactions um, that are not being submitted to the network, but we're sending them and we're signing them. So Alice signs the transaction saying that she owes me a certain amount of money. She sends it to me, and I sign it also. So that way, if Alice tries to steal money from me by sending a transaction with a lower amount, I can actually provide the valid one with both of our signatures so the entire network knows that it's valid, and then I can get the money that we both agreed on. And so this is what we've implemented in Starlight, which you can check out at uh, github.com slash interstellar slash starlight. Um, and so importantly, Starlight is built on the Stellar network. And so Stellar is a public blockchain network, which means anyone can run a node or sign and submit transactions. And it has support for multiple assets. Um, so that means that anybody can go and issue their own assets onto the Stellar network. So I could go and issue 1 million Vicky coins and send them. Um, or you know, financial institutions can issue backed assets. There's a pretty fast settlement time. It's about five seconds. And there's also some basic smart contract, tra contracting capability, which basically means that um, when you send transactions, you can also have nodes do a couple of other computations as they're verifying. 
And so in our Starlight implementation, um, a party on the network runs what's called an agent. And agents respond to four different types of inputs. There are user commands, things like, I would like to pay CryptoFlix one cent. Um, there are messages from other agents that you can receive from like incoming payment requests. You can see transactions on the network or respond to timer events. And each agent maintains a set of state machines for each of the channels that they have open. And so here we have our representation of the agent. We have an HTTP client for um, agent requests. We've built a persistent task queue for managing all of the Go routines that do things like submit transactions or send messages. Um, because we want our agents to be really lightweight and easy to run and just all neatly package it up, we use Bolt, which is an in-memory key value store that's written in Go. So it makes it super easy for us to use that to store all of our data in persist state. And then we also have a map of cancelers that make it really easy to clean up agents, um, cancel all of the running Go routines for each channel, and then easily respawn them from the state that we put in Bolt um, when we restart. Um, each agent, of course, keeps track of many channels, and these channels are pure data, so they're designed to be really easily marshaled and unmarshaled from JSON so that we can just stick those in Bolt. Um, and the channel keeps track of some state. Um, it also manages the amounts that are owed from both of the parties in the channel. And we also have these transactions that are being sent back and forth and being signed by both parties in case of settlement. Um, we also, so in order to do a lot of what an agent does is it sends messages, it sends transactions, and we want to be able to kick off those, um, those tasks and not really worry about them afterwards. So we built something called a task basket. And basically what this does is we define an interface. So anything that needs to be run is a task and we kick off a go routine that will run it until it's complete. And that way when we have agents that might have, you know, a hundred channels, which need to send a variety of transactions and, and messages, we don't really have to worry about um, those being complete because they're all being taken care of by the task basket. And so an example of that is here we have our message sending task. So this is if you want to propose a payment to another party or send them your pre-signed transaction, um, you just implement this run method. And all this does is it reads um, the message in and then it posts it to whatever counterparty you're trying to send it to. Also, these agents do a lot of watching, and so we have a watch channel routine that basically kicks off a series of other Go routines um, that manage the channel operations. So watching for payments into your account, um, pulling for messages from the other party, and then making sure that you're sending keep alive messages to keep your channel connection open. Okay, and then we have a quick video. So here you can see we have two Starlight agents up, and we're gonna open a channel send some payments in between them, and you can see it's all basically instantaneous. These payments get sent super fast between parties, and then you can close the channel, and this is when a transaction actually gets built and submitted on the network that settles out each party's respective balances. So in terms of what's next for Starlight, this is all really good and well, but a lot of transactions don't exactly follow this sort of two-party microtransaction model. You know, if you think about the payments that you make every day, very few of them are you sending a lot of payments between you and some other person. And so what would actually be super useful for most real-world applications is to have a network of payment channels where you can imagine that I can route payments through different channels, um, pay parties that I'm vaguely connected to, and then only have a small number of transactions that are actually settling on the public network. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done to support this kind of network, but there are also some exciting opportunities like being able to interoperate with similar networks that are on other platforms like Interledger or Lightning, which would mean that I could seamlessly send a transaction between something on the Stellar network and have it be received by somebody who's running a Bitcoin node and has a Bitcoin address. Um, so there's a lot of exciting potential, but definitely also a lot of work to be done in terms of the Starlight approach to scaling blockchains. And then to sort of switch gears and talk about another project, another experiment that the Interstellar team has been working on is called SlideChain. And so this is an implementation of what are called pegged sidechains. And so a two-way pegged sidechain is basically a way of transferring value between one network and another. And so a good analogy that I like to use is that it's like when you transfer US dollars or whatever fiat currency you have into poker chips at the casino. You know, you freeze the amount in, um, in one network, right, in the US dollar world, and then you get these other tokens with a new set of rules that you can use to play poker or whatever you want to do at the casino. And for slide chain, we use what's called a trusted custodian model. So this basically means that you trust one entity, the custodian, to faithfully exchange and not steal your money. 
And there are a variety of different approaches to doing pegging in side chains or doing this transfer. The trusted custodian model is the one that is most trust intensive, as you might have guessed. Um, but it also seemed the best for doing this sort of proof of concept experiment. And so the way that things work in slide chain is that here we're pegging from the Stellar network, which we've talked about, to a system that um, we've built called TXVM. And so you can sort of think of TXVM as just a single entity that processes and validates transactions. You know, it's like one machine that's building one blockchain. There's no consensus happening. Um, and so it makes it really good for sort of proving that we can move money on and off the Stellar network and use it in some other place. So the first thing we do when we want to peg in funds, when we want to move something out of Stellar and onto TXVM, is that we create a uniqueness token. And this is basically telling TXVM, I am expecting five US dollars to be issued to Alice. Then I'll do a payment from the Stellar network to my custodian of five US dollars, and I'll specify in the transaction memo field where we can put some extra data that it should go to Alice. And then the custodian is watching for this, it sees this transaction, and it performs an import which consumes this uniqueness token and then issues the $5 to Alice. Pegging out is um, sort of the opposite. We create a temporary Stellar account on the network to make sure that this peg out can only happen once. In TXVM, we lock our funds in a smart contract, and here the operations that we're doing is if we see something that is, um, suggests that the pegout was successful, we're going to retire the funds or just sort of remove them from TXVM, from our blockchain. And if there's a failure, we're gonna just return the funds to whoever sent them to us. And then we perform the actual pegout and we just pay the amount to whoever it's going to and then merge this temporary account. And so the temporary account just exists so that we can, this is uh, an operation that can only happen once. Cool. So in SlideChain, our custodian has um, a number of fields, but importantly, it manages some data, which we store in a SQL database. It has a Stellar account. Um, it has some fields for managing all of the transactions in TXVM. And we synchronize everything um, really easily using some nice Go features. And so when we launch a custodian, what happens is we basically kick off a number of Go routines that do things like watch for those peg-in transactions, that perform the imports, that watch for those exports, that perform the exports, um, and so on. And so here you can see we have our Go routine that's watching for peg-ins. And when we see one, we'll do a broadcast, which wakes up this Go routine that's then ready to import the peg-ins. And so this is super easy in Go and would be kind of a nightmare um, if we were, for example, still writing this in Rust. And so also something that's really nice is that TXVM happens to also be written in Go, and so it makes it really easy for us to just import our contract package from TXVM um, and to do things like build a smart contract that includes all of, um, that includes some data, um, to build a transaction including that smart contract, and then to submit it um, to TXVM. So all of that is super simple. Uh, in terms of our slide chain experiment, what we're looking to next is actually building out um, more robust versions of sort of what we would be pegging to. So we're moving funds off of the Stellar network, but we gotta be moving them somewhere. And most of that work for our team is focused on zero knowledge systems and privacy. So systems where it allows you to make these transactions and broadcast them to the network, but without people on the network knowing how much money you're paying to whom. Um, and we'll also sort of as a part of this work be exploring models for pegging other than the trusted custodian setup because you know, in most cases, a lot of people want the benefits of the blockchain. One of the key ones is not having to trust single entities like a custodian. So we detailed some experiments. Um, it's unclear what the future holds, but um, basically all of our work is open source. So if you're interested, you can check all of it out at intercellar.com slash protocol. We're gonna continue working on these things. We love contributions. A lot of these projects are in Go. And so if you're excited about blockchain development, it's definitely a get, great way to get involved. Thank you.